You are listening to the APSI Podcast, the association of people supporting employment first, with your host, Chris Davies. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Minnesota APSI Podcast, our second uh, podcast of the 2023 season. And we couldn't be more delighted to have Kevin Kling here with us today. Hello, Kevin. Hello. Uh, we're very excited, and we're going to get to to more about Kevin in a moment. But as I always want to do for anybody that, that perhaps you know is just checking in for the first time uh, to a Minnesota APSI podcast, and if that's you, welcome. And want to tell you a little bit more about you know Minnesota APSI and and National APSI, what we stand for. National APSI is truly the only membership organization that is solely committed to integrated competitive employment. Uh, we believe that employment is real wages, real expectations, the same that any working age adult uh, would have. And in fact, we believe that employment is indeed the, the avenue out of poverty and isolation. Uh, so that's just a little bit about Minnesota APSI. And uh, at this point, we like to uh, give uh, visual descriptions of ourselves. And so uh, I'll start. Uh, Kevin, I am uh, a white male. Uh, I am bald. I have a red beard. And uh, today I'm wearing blue jeans as well as a blue uh, vest and a blue shirt. Thanks. Uh, I'm Kevin Kling. I got a, uh, I'm 65 years old and I've got silver hair. I'm a white male. I have a glasses that look like they're from the 50s. They come in and out of fashion. Uh, I'm wearing dark pants uh, and a turtleneck. My left arm is shorter than my right, and I have a brace on that arm, and my right arm doesn't move from a motorcycle accident 20 years ago. So I know that's a lot, but it is. I kind of, yeah, I have some unique features. No, that's a great uh, great description. You know, since you said that about your glasses, uh, you do have kind of a Buddy Holly vibe going oh, on there. Man. Yeah, I was, I was just talking about Buddy Holly yesterday. Uh-huh. As I'm sure you probably know, Kevin, uh, the day the music died uh, was 64 years ago, just seven days ago, oh, know, on I February didn't. 3rd. So I was, I was actually last night doing a little something, and I was talking about uh, Buddy. So... Yeah, yeah, uh, very good, very good. So let's, uh, yeah, let's get into it. You know, we've already sort of got into it a little bit, uh, with our guest here. Um, you know, I just have to say, uh, I'm just going to be honest. I am absolutely thrilled, uh, that you're here with us today, Kevin. Uh, I, I actually have kind of goosebumps. You oh. know? I, I, I'm really excited. Um, uh. the, uh, you know, you are, you're, you're you're not only a Minnesota treasure, but you are a, a national treasure. You know, oh, thank uh, you. I would dare say. You know, Kevin is a, a playwright, uh, a humorist, a uh, performer. Uh, as, as you said, you've performed in, in gymnasiums all over the country, as well as the Kennedy Center. Mm-hmm. So, uh, pretty cool stuff. And been a commentator on, on national public radio, all things considered. And I understand you've been a you also you are also a regular guest. Uh, you know, on the Almanac and and also uh, a disability advocate. So yep. I don't mean to uh, take away from, from everything you're going to say, but uh, I just wanted to, to let the audience know just uh, how thrilled we are uh, to have you here. Uh, and you've even won an Emmy. So, I mean, oh, yeah. it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So we're excited. Uh, and uh, we're excited to, to see where this conversation goes. And we'd love to start by just... Haven't you, you know, talk us through a little bit about your, your personal background, growing up, all that good oh, stuff. First of all, I'm thrilled to be here. I mean, I love what you all are about and what you're doing and, uh, just, yeah, the, the, uh, just the importance of employment. It does. It gives us a voice. And that's, uh, one thing as a, I am, I am a storyteller and that's how I make my living and having a voice is absolutely crucial. And, and when we do, when we are, uh, have a purpose, have a trajectory and momentum in life. We, uh, it does give us voice. It gives us a platform. So I'm so thrilled about what you're doing. Um, uh, as far as, uh, my, I grew up in Minnesota. I'm from Missouri originally. Yeah. But, uh, I grew up here. Uh, and I was thinking about this because 
I was thinking, how did even early in my life, uh, my disability start to inform what I might be in my life? And, uh, and there was a couple of things. One of them was, and when I was three years old, I was in Shriners Hospital and it was 1960 and all the things you hear about hospitals in the sixties kind of ring true. They were very cold places. They didn't really, there wasn't really an understanding of the patient as a story. It was the patient was a series of symptoms. So it was a very cold atmosphere. But I had this doctor, Dr. Tibby, and he said that one of the first things he goes, uh, Kevin, we're going to fix your arm. Oh, God, I started crying and crying because like my arm made me special and I didn't want him to fix it because that's my grandmother always says that's what makes you special. And I was so worried he was going to make me like everybody else. So I, I told him that and he said, OK, here's the deal. We won't fix it. We'll just make it work better and it'll still be you, it, you. Then you'll still be you. And I said, OK. And I was three years old and I'll never forget making that deal with Dr. Tippy, which guided me through health care, through everything. Lawyers, doctors, preachers, they're on the journey with you. And Dr. Tippy was clearly on my same journey. His success was tied to my own. And uh, that really laid that foundation of, of when you're, when you are working with somebody, you know, if you're on the same journey, it's going to go a lot better. Anyway, so that was a early lesson. Uh, and, and then, uh, moving to Minnesota and, uh, and growing up here and just having a, I have what I would call a, a really great, really great childhood. I lived in the country in Maple Grove and, played all played with all the kids uh there wasn't so much and i don't know whether it was financially there wasn't so much of a separation in those days there was special ed in schools so you we had special course a class that we would go to all together and yet but we were always in the mix always in the herd and so i really loved that that i was always part of the herd um and 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 then but the special ed part that was a whole nother family that I was associated with, and, which I, and then again, uh, kind of like Doctor Tivy had a third grade teacher, Mrs. Keller. <laughs> Mrs. Keller, I just found one of her report cards, and she said on this report card, "Kevin has no understanding of the material, but I'm not worried about him." And it was like, boom! There's my teacher. You know, I'm going to remember that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How can you get a better endorsement? And so uh, she just cut me loose. It was like. You know what? And, and I know that led to my storytelling and I know my arm led to my storytelling because, and I know I'm blabbing a lot here, but people would, that's uh, what you're here for. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I could tell early on people would refer to me. They would use different words around me than other kids, you know? And I, so I already knew that even though I was part of the herd, I was cut from the herd. And, but I, so I started getting into rhetoric. What are the words they're using? How are they using them? And they would inform me about the people that I was talking to were talking to me. And, and, uh, and with that information, even as a kid, I could start to get what I needed out of them because it was the rhetoric that it was more how and, uh, why they said something was even more important than what they said. I could already start reading people and I already started using rhetoric and the use of language, even as a kid, not only in terms of understanding, but a way to, um, voice, both what I needed and self advocacy, even at that age. Um, so, and it was a, and it was, it's such a powerful tool. Um, language is so, so, such a powerful tool. Yeah, that's, that's really well said. You know, it's interesting. You, you uh, were born in Missouri or mm. Missouri, as, you. as you say. <laughs> nice. Uh, and uh, when did you move to Minnesota? What age? I was five. Okay, you were five. Yeah. The reason I say it's interesting is I was born in Dallas, Texas. A lot okay. of people don't know that. And I moved here when I was four. So, and, uh, lived over in Prospect Park, Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the way you describe your growing up, it was like that. I mean, we're always in the alley playing with the kids and, uh, it, it really shapes you. It sounds like the people, uh, you grew up with really shaped, uh, as you said, your language and, uh, the idea of rhetoric being a storyteller. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what's it like? being a professional storyteller. Well, and for the most it is a great it is the greatest job. I mean, being up in front of people and getting to tell stories. I started I cut my teeth in the theater 
And I, I just always wanted to do everything. And when you're the storyteller, you get to do everything. And, uh, but one of the coolest things about it is a storytelling is the heart of it is you have to be in the right, in the place, in the moment you're telling the story. So oftentimes I'll go in thinking I'm going to tell all these stories and the whole sheet will go right out the window and I'll tell a whole nother series of stories just because of who is in the audience, who are you talking to? And, and I tell, and I tell people when I teach storytelling, what makes you the expert of the story? Why are you the expert in this case? And what do you have to offer this audience? You know, and uh, I, 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 the storytelling goes really well when a kid comes up and says, you're almost as good as my grandpa. Oh, then yeah. you know you nailed yeah. it because that, yeah. Yeah, tell me more about uh, teaching. Are you actively teaching storytelling yeah, right I do, now? I, yep, I do workshops every now and again and I uh, got one coming up here in a week or so. Uh, and yeah, and it's it, it's mostly helping people because People are get in their own way when it comes to telling stories. So it's like, why? How do you? A good storyteller enjoys telling their story. How can we get to the point? <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> find a way. Yeah. How do we get to the point where you are enjoying yourself in front of people? Yeah. And that's really the one of the one of the keys to storytelling. And yeah, and then do, giving some tips. Um, you know, using signposts, storytelling works in imagery, which is really important, not just for storytelling, but a lot of times in life is that you need to imagine something and the words you're conveying, you're not conveying words, you're conveying imagery. That's why when the kid comes up and says, you're almost as good as my grandpa, yeah. I have conjured in him right. his grandpa, not my grandpa. Sure. And that's what you want to do. Sure. And it's the same with history. If you're talking about history, you can't go back in history. People think you can, you can't. You can pull history forward. So what we're doing is pulling things into people's minds that are in the audience and conjuring their worlds using their vocabulary and their vernacular. Sure, I, I love that. It sounds like you're talking also a lot about you know getting to that moment where you can be your true, authentic self. That's a great and, way and to put it. And people pick up on that. Yeah. When, do you... Do you recall the very first time you can remember when you like felt like you officially told a story to an audience? Um, yeah, uh, there's two examples. One is the first time a producer came up and I was in a kitchen at a party just telling like with my buddies. And she goes, do you want to do that on stage? And I said, what? She goes, just what you did in the kitchen. And that launched me. The next year I was on stage and I never looked back. Wow. Um, but that was the first time professionally. Yeah. I think the first story I really remember telling that I realized, and it was about my arm. I was um, uh, learning to ski and I was going up a rope toe and at the bottom of the hill it said, no long hats, long scarves or woolly mittens on the rope toe. And I'm standing with my brother and we have on long scarves and long hats, woolly mittens. <laughs> and I grabbed onto the rope toe and on the way up the rope twists. So if you're wearing woolly mittens, it twists into the rope. Oh, and I got to the top and I couldn't let go because my mittens were woven into the rope. So I got my right arm free, but I couldn't get my left arm free. And it's actually starting to pick me up off the ground. And I'm like, oh my God, my God. So I let go of my brace. I'm wearing a brace and my brace flew off and I got my arm free, but my bla brace flew through the air and the woman behind me goes, oh my gosh, it's his arm. And she's down and people were piling into her and, uh, so I told my mom that story later and my mom laughed so hard. She just couldn't. And I went, okay. I, I just, I remember that effect on making my parents laugh. Mm -hmm. And when that, when I started getting people, having people respond with, it was, I don't know why it just felt so good. Yeah. And so those, and I always loved storytellers in, in my brother's a great storyteller and, and, and then I would read like Flannery O'Connor, Mark Twain, all these story, all these authors that write with a voice. You can hear their voice jump off the page. And those are my favorite writers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. You know, that, <clears throat> that scene you were describing with the tow rope, it, it sounds like a, a scene out of the Christmas story, yeah. you know, or something like that. Just, oh, I can just picture it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, employment. Uh, yep. uh, specifically, you know, employment for people with disabilities. Um, you recently did uh, uh, 
some work uh, with the Minnesota uh, Employment and Economic Development yep. um, uh, and as well as uh, uh, the Disability Hub and you were – uh, sort of helping them with some videos, right, for some young adults, uh, talking about their stories into adult life, working life. And uh, I've had a chance to to watch some of the videos. They're oh, very well done. Uh, and, you know, just tell us uh, about that experience and, and sort of your work, uh, your work with those young, young folks. You know, it was one of the best experiences I can ever imagine. I, I went in, um, you know, pretty pretty open to, okay, what's going to happen? We had some, you know, these questions and just the way people of this new generation talk, uh, talk about disability and we are slowly moving. We're not there yet. And it's frustrating, but you know, I've seen these stages with, um, with with how we've changed from, you know, tolerance, you know, uh, and I never liked that word tolerance because it was like, we're still outside the door. And then acceptance, we're still outside the door. And we're told now is in embracing disability. I mean, and when I hear the advocacy of people, of, of especially young people talk now, it's not, it's not how do we fit in? It's we already fit in. We're, we are part of this world and, you know, and, and this is what I bring to the world, not in a way of, and, and in my youth, it was, we, we tried to get people to not notice our disabilities. And now it's like, this is what I bring to the table. And it's good. It's like, mm-hmm. you're looking outside the box. The things I can bring are, are going to make your company going to make your, you know, and so one of the things I noticed with, with, uh, with the younger people that I interviewed were how they embraced their disability and how that was um, just a, 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 a plus in, in their world. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it too was you, and you mentioned this earlier and I was so happy to hear this when you said we're, we're trying to help people find out how to live their best life. And in order to do that, employment is really, it, it does a lot of different things. Um, there, it, being a storyteller, I go to back to the, the one god with a disability was a god named Hephaestus. And Hephaestus was thrown off Mount Olympus when he was a baby, and he shattered his legs, he dragged himself to the underworld, and made a forge. And he's the god that created Cupid's arrows, uh, uh, Apollo's chariot, all these different things for the gods. Well, Hephaestus then became a god again, even though he was thrown from Mount Olympus, because he created things people needed. And so it was like through his art, through his job, he he became a god again. It literally pulled him out of hell. And uh, when I think of that, it's it it it's so true. It's so true that when when we are connected with it, it connects us with ourselves in a way that. Uh, we know how we fit in a community. We know how we um, contribute to a community, the purpose that we bring. And again, like we said earlier, that gives you a voice. Then you go, okay, I can speak, I, you know, I can speak because I'm a contributor to this society. Right, right. Yeah, it sounds like a a great experience. And I I really like what you're you're talking about. Uh, in terms of you know people realizing they didn't have to change who they were no. that they were they were good they were great just the way they were and it was about capitalizing on who they were in the right job yep. you know and and that is what we all do i mean yep. that's a universal concept there are a bajillion things i'm not good at oh man and, and a ton of job jobs that wouldn't be a good you know match for me and and i think through the stories we continue to tell and have been telling and you're probably noticing this too, is the expectation is different. And the young people today are growing up with that uh, paradigm of why shouldn't I work, not why should I work? Yeah. You know, so yeah, so that, that's, uh, uh, that's great. The work is, uh, work you did there is great. And how could somebody find those videos if they wanted to go back and, and check them out? Um, they go to the hub, the okay. disability hub, uh, with that, and it's through the state. And, uh, yeah, and then, there's a uh, there's a whole series. I, the, it's another like it, it, you know it's like apps. It's a, it's another great you know just a reference point. It's and they can uh, not only do they have these videos with all these interviews, but they also have you know different ways you can you can chart a you know a way to employment. But I, I enjoyed doing those interviews because 
it it was uh it was a very personal way into it you know it was just it was still the same information but it was through a person and i and i wanted to tell this story because one of my favorite stories was i don't know if you saw the one with ethan he designed software for the james webb telescope so uh, uh ethan needs care 24 7 and and i asked him i said e- ethan did your disability play into designing aerospace? I mean, I'm talking to a rocket scientist right, here. Right. And I go, did that, did that lead into that in any way? And he goes, he said, yeah. He goes, uh, when I was a kid on the playground, I was in a wheelchair. He said, I could watch kids play, but I, I wasn't really, I couldn't really get into the mix. But he said, but already I was watching bodies interact in space i was watching not only how the static one works but the movements how they work together in space and he said so i was already designing aerospace software as a kid wow. without even knowing it and he said i'm pretty much doing the same thing now that i was doing then and i was like oh man that's there's a prime example of what we're talking about yeah. that yeah i can't think of a better example of just somebody truly capitalizing on their strengths you know what they what they bring to the table yeah so yeah that's that's exciting um yeah so you know just sort of just going a little more big picture and and thinking about the future you know you mentioned earlier you, you can't go back in history but you can pull from history uh to if i'm saying it right to sort of lead you forward mm-hmm. uh you know what are um what are some of the, the the hopes and dreams you have for for our youth uh, of today and um, and and people in general? You know, in, in terms of the employment arena and uh, in life. Well, I'm finding I'm learning more than I'm teaching these days. I'm uh, working on a new project with uh, TPT Channel Two with this uh, with this amazing group of, of folks that are are putting together a, um, how arts. And disability and medicine, or it's kind of that's the triangle that we're working with. And there's a, a um, curatorial staff that is putting the piece together, and there's folks with disabilities on the staff. Oh man, they are coming! Boy, they come loaded for bear. I just love it. They they just they came out of the blocks flying, and I was sitting there just. I was like skiing behind a powerboat. <laughs> I'm like, what am I even dealing with there? You know, they were mm. voicing things that I've just thought, you know, and I, and, and so we were in a time, uh, uh, we can voice things. And the good thing about that is, is it is in any working environment, there are things you're going to need. There's adaptations you're going to need. There's different things you're going to need and not to, and it's going to really affect mm. the quality of your work. And just to know you can just, it's okay to bring that up. It's not even, it's not just okay. It's, it's necessary. And, to, and to voice your needs, to voice things, you, you know, that, 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 that could help you be a, a better employee. Um, and, and just the way that people now have actually embraced their disability is just music to my ears. Cause I got to do that as, as, as I mean, in the arts, one of the things that every artist looks for is a perspective into the art form. And I was born with a perspective. And so I come from the outside looking in, which is what artists do. And, uh, and to see these other artists, you know, be aware of that. Sure. And voice it. So I'm learning a lot more than I'm teaching in, in, these days. And, uh, and I couldn't be happier. I just, I leave these meetings and I'm just, skipping around the house it's so great what's yeah, going on yeah yeah i really like uh you know what you're saying there about learning you know i've been a professional in the employment field for for many many years but uh i i feel like i'm learning every day yeah. you know still and uh you know it seems like sometimes the best thing we can do for people is to get out of their way yeah you know and uh and uh, people are, are more and more empowered, I think, than they, they ever were. So that's well, yeah. I got to jump in here. Yeah, one jump, of my that's what you're things, here for. I've, um, I, I heard Ira Glass do a, a, um, a commencement speech for a high oh, school one okay. time. And his one piece of advice was trust your own good taste. Mm. And, you know, it's just what you're saying. It's like our job really is to get out of the way, but to provide a way 
yeah. to provide the path, you know, sure. that, and, and not, and that's the thing about the best guide. That's going back to Dr. Tippy. That's like Virgil and Dante. And it's, it's, you are, you are just making sure that the person is, is on their best journey, on their best. And so listening is crucial. Just the, the idea of listening and, listening with intent to do something about it. Sure. Uh, a guide walking side by side. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a good, thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. That's going with me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love what all, you just all, said. All the things I say are trademarked. I just all want right. to make okay, sure you know no. that. So. <laughs> no, that's a beautiful, that is really nice. Uh, oh, well, I, I'm having a blast. You know, it's, uh, we're, as our time starts to kind of, kind of wind down here, I, I want to, you know, let everybody know, I mentioned earlier that you, you uh, you have won an Emmy, uh, yeah. which is very exciting for a um, a PBS documentary, right? Uh, yes. Lost and Found. Uh, where could one find that documentary if they want to watch it? I uh, go to the TPT. Uh, you know, they have either a website, they mm-hmm. have a, a um, and you can go there. And I know I I punched it in before. It's called Lost and Found. Okay, and uh, and then it, they will lead you to it. All yeah. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. I think you could even probably just write it in a sure. Google or sure. something and yeah. they'll hunt it down. What about if I went home and I uh, took my Xfinity remote and I said, you know, lost and found, Kevin Kling. You think it would come up? I, gee, I don't know. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to find out. We'll get I, back to the audience on that. I'm going to try that the, when I get home. This is where the youngsters come. <laughs> get me a nephew. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. My son, he's, uh, well, he's almost 16, but he just... It's it's like he's grown up with technology. So yeah. it's not even like something he's learned. It's just it's just it's almost like how we learn language, yeah. uh, whatever your mother tongue is. That's he's immersed in it, and he just grows up with this. Yeah, just, but that's another thing too with yeah. employment too. Mm-hmm. I mean, with and I mean, it was so interesting during. Uh, it has been interesting during COVID. How, for me, disability has just led the pack because people had to learn different kinds of, you know, technology, which right. is part of our lives. They also had to learn to live in a world that wasn't built for them, which is part of our lives. Right. And so right. it's been interesting how not only has disability led the way, but we don't have to explain ourselves as much as we used to because now everybody knows what it's mm-hmm. like to live in a world that wasn't built for them. Yeah. And I, I found that before when I would go into communities and, and have to do these long introductions, these invitations so people could finally understand, uh, you know, uh, 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 be on board enough to where I could get into the the more difficult mm-hmm. stuff. I can skip so much of that now because people know what it's like to, yeah. you know, to, to live through uh, mm-hmm. some of these things, you know? Yeah, that is a really good point uh employers it seems like today are 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 much more apt to try things a different way yeah because we all were thrust into this you know all of a sudden this deep end of the pool and had to figure out how to how to swim yeah so yeah that's a good point i i don't know if this is almost embarrassing but i had never even been on a zoom call before uh before this all all happened no a lot i didn't even Somebody said, you know, oh, I got Zoom, and I was, oh, that's nice. And I thought it was like some kind of new vacuum cleaner, and uh, I had no idea what they were talking about. Oh boy, uh, it's it's not really funny. I mean, it's a it's a it's been a difficult time for a lot of people. We don't make light of it, but no. uh, it it definitely forced us to to think differently yeah. and and realize that we could work differently, you know, as well. Um, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting time to say the least. Kevin, you also have a website, right? Uh, KevinKling dot com. Yep. So uh, that's it. Yeah, so K E V I N K L I N G dot com, and and I'm sure people could find uh, a lot of your work, you know, on there, you know, as well. Uh, you know, so please uh, check that out. You know, do you have any? Um, just final messages you you would like to to you know say to our audience today just uh, you know a message of hope or or anything you'd like to to leave folks with well yeah i guess uh in in terms of storytelling if you uh find out where you you know use the story of your life to figure out kind of where you're headed i think that i think that that provides a lot of hope when we use our past we use our strengths and then think of ourselves in the, in the future, um, because when you can imagine something, you're on your way to achieving it. And I think it is really important to uh, imagine first 
and then and then head toward it. And uh, and so yeah, think of yourself as a story. Um, and yeah, uh, one of my uh, a favorite story is uh, about a tracker who said, if you track by uh, footprints. Mm. And you miss a footprint, you'll lose the quarry. But if you think of the quarry as a story, you'll always find it. Mm. And so I think that even in terms of working in jobs, even in terms of working, you know, in your life, how can you frame it as a story? And what's the next, what would be the next part of the story to achieve the end that you're searching for? Yeah. And it, it feels like when you frame it that way, um, that you, you don't necessarily get stuck because the right. story's unfolding. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh the funnest part of any story yeah. is when something goes wrong. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> it's not in life. You go, oh, no. Don't but, I know it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're retelling a story, yeah, the more golden something is, mm-hmm. probably the more it hurt. <laughs> oh, it's, it's very true. Very true. Well, well, thank you, you know, so much again uh, for joining us today. Uh, it's been a, a real honor and a thrill to have you. Thanks. Uh, likewise. You're, you're just a really, uh, you know, warm person. I, you and I, uh, you know, commiserated over this uh, a little bit about a month ago, but uh, I actually got to be Kevin's uh, chauffeur yeah. uh, for a Minnesota APSI state conference. Um, I want to say like 2005 I, it was or, a, or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. a long time I ago. I totally remember. A long that. time ago. And Kevin was the, the keynote speaker and uh, so I got to, to kind of, you know, pick you up and take you and, and we got to chit chat in the car yeah. and and never would have I imagined at that time that my story was going to unfold and lead me to sitting here with you today on the Minnesota APSI podcast. Well, it's so been an honor. It's, uh, well, likewise. And thank you. Uh, we appreciate your support and uh, not only of Minnesota APSI, but this all you do, you know, for, for people and, and humanity and uh, love uh, what you have to say about, you know, telling stories. And as I always like to 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 end the the podcast with uh you know on behalf of our executive producers Dana Eisfeld and Connor Zelinsky we call him Mr. C uh <laughs> and uh your uh we have a live studio audience that everybody can't see today but your uh uh your main person Mary yeah, is Mary, is here she's today she's a champion for me yeah yeah, yeah. so shout yeah. out to Mary yay who's uh, in the audience today and uh and I know Kevin is in lockstep uh with with what we believe and that is simply that if you believe it you can achieve it